Okay. This morning, we're going to be uh, reading from Genesis. We've been talking about altars. And uh, the first place that the word altar is mentioned in the Bible, it's, uh, it's a Hebrew word. It's, it's Mizbaak is the it's Hebrew word. And uh, I, I, I guess that's the way you pronounce it. I don't know. But it, it really, it comes from a root word that means, uh, that means to slaughter or to kill. And we had said when we were talking about altars, we had said that whenever there's an altar, whenever they build an altar, it was a place of encounter, a place where they would encounter God. It was, it was a place of sacrifice, it was a place of worship, and it was a place of remembrance. And uh, the first time that word is used is in Genesis concerning Noah. But it's not the first place of sacrifice. How many people know where the first sacrifice took place in the Bible? Anybody have a guess? In the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden. Who was the first one to make a sacrifice? It was, it was God. If you remember the story, and it's, you remember it's history, it's not just a story, it's history, but when Adam and Eve fell, when they, when they sinned against God, and you can read about it in Genesis chapter 3, we're not going to read all these texts, but when Adam and Eve fell and sinned against God, they realized they were naked. They had guilt. And they tried to cover themselves. Remember, they, they picked leaves off a tree, uh, fig leaves, and they tried, to, they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. How many people know a fig leaf might be pretty big, but it's not going to last very long when, once you take it off the tree? So to cover them, to cover their nakedness, what God had to do, he had to kill an animal and take the skin off the animal to cover them. Now, I, uh, and that was the first offering. That was the first sacrifice that was made. God had to do it. This last Wednesday, uh, we had to put our dog to sleep. Anybody ever have to put a dog to sleep? You know. We had our puppy dog. We had her for 15 years. And uh, her name was Shelly. And she, was, she wasn't eating and she was sick. And you know how that gets. If you ever had a, had a dog or an animal, you had to have to put to sleep. And when I, when I got ready to take her to the vet, Rose said goodbye at the, at the house and she was sad, you know, and we were sad. And I took her, I put her in the car, and I was driving to the vet. And, you know, I was like, I was like I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right, you know. And uh, she was sitting there. I'm like, it's okay, girls. I'm, I'm going to be all right, you know. And I was like, you know how men are. Brr. And uh, we got to the vet's office, and, and the vet wasn't there. He wasn't there yet. The only person who was there was, like, the technician. Her name is Linda. And we've, we've known her from going there many times. And I brought her in, and she said, well, you know, you know she had congestive heart failure. She just wasn't, you know. Uh, so we took her in the room, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right, you know. And uh, she said, I'm going to give her a little shot. It's going to be a tranquilizer shot, and uh, that's going to calm her down until the doctor gets here, you know. And I said, okay. So I'm, I'm there, and she gave her the shot, and the, and the lady said, you want to spend some time with her? And I said, no. I said, we've said our goodbyes, you know. And I started, you know, I was like, and I started sobbing. I, uncontrollably. I mean, I, I didn't cry like that for my dad when he died. I, I started like, and I thought the girl was going to give me a shot. <laughs> I, thought, I, I was looking to see if she had another needle there because I was crying. I was sobbing and, oh, you know, and I, I thought it was going to be tough and I went out for a couple minutes. And she understood because I'm sure she saw it before. And she gave me a little hug and she said, it'll be all right. I said, okay. But I was thinking, if I, if I, if I was so, if I was so, so broken by you know, having to say goodbye to my little... I wonder, and the Bible doesn't tell us this, but I wonder if God wept when he had to kill that animal to get a covering for Adam and Eve. I wonder if he wailed and cried that he had to take a life of an, of an animal that didn't do anything to anybody to cover his fallen creation. And I wonder... And again, this, the Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know what kind of animal it was. It could have been a lamb. It could have been a cow. It could have been a cow. We don't know. But I wonder if when he put those, put those coverings on Adam and Eve, I wonder if they were bloody. You know, I, I don't think he took them to the dry cleaners before he gave them to them. They were covered with the blood of an innocent victim at the first sacrifice 
that God had to make to cover the sins of his creation. The next place where we read about a sacrifice, and again, it doesn't use the word altar, but the next place is the very next chapter in Genesis chapter 4, when we read about Cain and Abel. We know the story, the two sons of, the two first sons of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. And we know that Cain brought an offering. He brought, you know, fruits and vegetables, and he brought the stuff that he had grown to the Lord. And Abel, what did he bring? He took one of the firstlings of his flock, he took a lamb, and he, and he killed the lamb, and he took the blood, and, and he offered. And we know that Abel's offering was acceptable to God, but Cain's was not. Why? Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. God can only accept an offering if it costs a life. Because life is in the blood. Why is it like that? Why did God make it like that? I don't know, but that's the way it is. He said that blood is what covers us from sin. So Abel brought a proper offering. He brought a lamb, uh, killed the lamb, took the blood, offered it to God. Cain brought his fruits and vegetables, which I'm sure he worked hard to grow. God said, I don't want them. That didn't cost anything. That didn't cost life. You see, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through faith in Christ Jesus. If our sins are to be forgiven, it's going to cost a life somewhere. We know the story that instead of Cain doing what was right, he instead of, of, of shedding the blood of a, of a lamb or a goat, he instead shed the blood of his brother, Abel. And the Bible says the blood of Abel still cries out from the ground. It's still crying out. It's still crying out. Now that brings us to Genesis chapter 9. The first place where the word altar is used, because we're talking about these meeting places, okay? And I want you to look, I'm sorry, chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. This is Noah. Now how many people, we all know the story of Noah, don't we? In the days of Noah, the Bible says that the hearts of men were wicked continually. The earth was full of wickedness and evil. There might have been millions of people, maybe a billion people on the earth at that time. Before the flood, I believe that the earth, if you read the Bible, when God created the earth, he put water underneath the air and he put water over the air. I believe that before the flood, there was a covering over the earth of water or ice that kept the temperature just the same all over the globe. People lived to be hundreds of years old. So a lot of people read that in the Bible and say, well, that's impossible. Well, it's not if the, the harmful rays of the sun are filtered out. It was a, it was a, 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 a climate utopia. It never rained. Instead, it was, the ground was watered because it was like a big terrarium, if you know what that's, what that's like. It, you never have to water it because the water recycles, and that's the way it was before the flood. And men grew evil, and men grew wicked, and humanity turned their back on God, much like what's happening today. Because Jesus said that his return will be as in the days of Noah, when everybody was wicked and everybody was evil and the whole world had turned their back on God, that's, well, that will be like the time when he comes back. But even in that time, when, when all the world was wicked, there was one man in his family that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. His name was Noah. He had three sons. And he and his sons and their wives, God told Noah to prepare an ark, a big ship. I don't know if you happen to see this, but I think a fellow over in Sweden or Denmark somewhere built an ark uh, to, the, to the proportions that was in the Bible. I don't know if, if you go on Yahoo on the, on the internet, you can see a picture of this thing. He built this big ark, just like according to, the, to what the Bible says he should do. But Noah built this ark. It took him 120 years. And can you just imagine, now it had never rained. Nobody ever had to build a boat. He was doing something that nobody had ever done before because God told him to do it. He was supposed to build this ark, and he was supposed to put on this ark his family and, 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 and uh, specimens of every kind of creature that was alive at that time. 
Now, when we think of this, we think he puts, you know, two of everything, male and female, two of everything. But that's not what it says. Unclean creatures, he put two of everything. But clean creatures, what were considered clean creatures, he put like seven of every kind. Okay? Put them all on the ark. And God said, I'm going to send judgment on the earth because of the wickedness of mankind. And when they got in the ark, Noah preached to them 120 years. Nobody listened to him. Which, you know, isn't anything strange. Nobody listened to him. But when the door closed, and God decided to take that shroud of water that was all over the earth and begin to let it fall all at once, man, a rainstorm like you've never seen. And it did that for 40 days. And all the earth was covered with water. And anybody that wasn't in the ark was killed. Judgment. God sent judgment. The opportunity to be saved was there, but they, re they rejected, they resisted. So when Noah and his family were shut up in the ark for all that time, for several months, until the waters receded and dry ground was once again there. It says that he left the ark. And here's what he did in verse 20 of Genesis chapter 9. What did he do? Noah built a what? An altar. He built a place of worship. He built a place of sacrifice. He built a place of remembrance and a place of encounter. He built a place where he wanted to worship his God for God's mercy and grace. God had mercy on Noah. He had mercy on humankind. And that he prepared an ark. It says that he built an altar unto the Lord, and he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And listen, the Lord, when Noah made this offering, he smelled. Remember we said that that altar of incense in the, in the temple, when that aroma would go up, God would smell it, and it was a sweet, it was a sweet smelling savor. When, when Noah offered all these animals on the altar, God was able. He, he breathed it in, and it became a sweet smelling savor. And the Lord said in his heart, Listen, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. How many... There's no, listen, there's no good thought in me. If you don't teach a kid right, he's going to end up doing wrong. That's just the way it is. You, you don't have to teach a kid to lie, to steal, to cheat. You've got to teach him to do right. Because why? Because we've inherited Adam's sin. Our thoughts are only evil. Without some kind of outside influence, without some kind of outside teaching... He says, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. While we're living in this present creation, in this earth, there's going to be coming a new heaven and a new earth. But while we're in this one, we're going to have winter, spring, summer, fall. Planning, harvest, planning, harvest. This has been going on ever since then. And it says in chapter 9, listen, after, after Noah made this altar and offered all these sacrifices, all these animals, shed the blood of who knows how many thousands of animals, it says God blessed Noah and his sons. He blessed them. They were the remnant. They were the ones left over from all that evil wickedness. And, and God blessed them. And he said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Verse 2. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and all that moves upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Mankind is clearly the dominating life form on this planet. Now, listen. If I get in a place with a hungry lion, and, and there's no way out, I'm going to be supper for the lion, okay? It doesn't mean that, you know, but what it means is mankind has controlled this planet. We're, we're the ones in control of everything. The reason why things get polluted is because we pollute them. 
The reason why, you know, I, for those of you who are old enough to remember Pittsburgh before the Great Renaissance, before all the steel companies moved out, <laughs> remember? You've seen pictures of Pittsburgh back in the 30s and 40s when all you could see is black smoke everywhere. We're the ones that God made, he gave us dominion over this planet. He gave us control over this planet. And it says right here, verse 3, Every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Many people believe that before the flood, man was a vegetarian. They didn't eat meat. But after the flood, God has told man, it's all yours to eat. He says, in verse 4, but he gives a restriction. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso, whoso sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Now what God is doing here, he is validating human life. This is the first command of what we would call capital punishment. I'm not going to get into the capital punishment deal. I'm not into that. All I'm saying is God told Noah, listen, life is so precious that if you take a man's life deliberately, and if you go later on in the law, there were provisions for accidental death, certainly. But if somebody would deliberately take a man's life like Cain did to his brother, they were, they were supposed to pay with their own life. Life is precious. I preached a message here a couple weeks ago, worshiping at the altar of life in a culture of death. We live in a culture of death, but life is precious. That's why when somebody dies or something dies, that's what, why we hurt so bad. When we have to say goodbye to a loved one or even a pet, our hearts break. Death is painful. It's separation. He says, Verse 6, Whoso shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Verse 7, And you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. Verse 8, And God spoke unto Noah and to his son, saying, And behold, I will establish my covenant. Now here's an agreement, a covenant. I will establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. Verse 11. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall, you be, shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. God made a promise to Noah. I will never again destroy the earth with a flood. I'll never again judge the earth with a flood. The Bible says, if you go on, the judgment is coming, but it's not coming by water. It's coming by fire. He says, I'll never destroy the earth with a flood. I'll never do that again. He says, and look what he says. He gives him a token, verse 12. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I made between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For perpetual generations, that means forever. Here's, here's, here's the agreement. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. You know, every time you look up and see a rainbow, that's a token of God's promise to us that he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. Did you know that? He lets us see rainbows to remind us of his mercy and his grace, to remind us of his covenant with Noah. Now, we listen to this and we hear this and we say, that's Noah, that's the Old Testament, that's a long time ago. What's that have to do with me? How many people know everything has everything to do with us? Amen. It's all about Jesus. Because these things we've been talking about, these pictures we've been seeing, these events that happened historically, everything that God has done and written in his book was for a purpose of pointing us to Jesus Christ. So I want you to turn with me as we've read all this, I want you to turn with me to the New Testament, if you will. To Matthew chapter 26. We know that 
Jesus came here. He was God from all eternity. He was the God that created everything. He was the God that had to kill the animal in the garden to cover Adam and Eve. He was the God that entreated with Cain and said, listen, sin is waiting at the door. Bring a right sacrifice and everything will be okay. He's the God that has dealt with, uh, with people from that time until now. He's the eternal, everlasting, ever-living God, the same yesterday, today, and forever, Jesus Christ. Now, we know that he came here to destroy the works of the devil. He came here to buy back his fallen creation. And we know that in the Old Testament, every sacrifice, every feast day, everything that was done, every drop of blood that was shed in the Old Testament in sacrifice on altars was all a picture of what he came to do. He came to do it all. And we know that on the night before his crucifixion, Jesus sat down with his disciples at what we call the Last Supper that we're going to be partaking in today. And when he sat down at that supper, he broke the bread and he took the cup. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. This is the cup of the new covenant. You know, my blood which is shed for you. And his disciples didn't have a clue what he was talking about. He offered them the cup of the new covenant. A new covenant. Not the covenant he made with Noah. Not the covenant he made with, with the children of Israel. But a new covenant that he offers to everybody. And in verse 36 of chapter 26, after they had eaten, remember we back up a little bit. Let's, let's look at Matthew chapter uh, 26 and verse 26. Let's start there. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Verse 31. Then said Jesus unto them, All you shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go unto, uh, before you to Galilee. And they answered and said unto them, We're not going to be offended at you, Jesus. Offended at you? Man, we've been walking with you for three and a half years. We've heard your teaching. We've seen you do miracles. We, su we supported you. We were with you. We, we, we spent time with you. We listened to you. We heard you teach us. We're not going to be offending you, Jesus. We'll fight for you. We'll die for you. Didn't know they all said that. And Peter said that first, but they all said it. Peter answered and said unto him in verse 33, Though all men shall be offended because of you, yet I will never be offended. Come on, you ever... Well, I'll never let you down. I'll be there with you. Anybody ever tell you that? You know, even though people might be well-meaning in telling you that stuff, sometimes they just can't be there. Peter, he meant, he meant every word he said. When he said, Peter, I'll, never, I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. Peter didn't know what was coming. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you this night, before the cock crow th three times, uh, you shall de de deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with you, yet will I not deny you. Yeah, Peter, right. Just wait. Okay, now, verse 36. This is where I want to come to. I wanted to read up to it. Verse 36. Then comes Jesus with them, this is after the supper. This is the night before the crucifixion. At this very minute, while this is going on with Jesus, Judas is getting a bunch together to bring with him to, to take Jesus. Jesus uh, then comes Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, in verse 36, and said unto his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray. And he took with him Peter and the son, two sons of Zebedee, who were James and John. They were like his inner circle. And he began to be sorrowful, and very heavy. Jesus? He's the Son of God. He created everything. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He knows, he knows what's coming. 
He knows the end from the beginning. He knows he's going to rule and reign in David's seat. What's he sorrowful about? Listen. He said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Maybe as sorry as it was when he had to kill that lamb in the garden. Maybe as sorry as it was when he had to see Cain slay his brother Abel. Maybe, maybe as sorry as when he saw the last time you or I sinned. He says, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and he prayed, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. Some folks will read that and say, Well, Jesus must have been afraid. He wasn't afraid. But Jesus must have been trying to get out of it. He wasn't trying. He knew he couldn't get out of it. He knew there was only one hope for mankind, and that was his shed blood. But he was wrestling with the idea that in just a few hours, he was going to be hanging on a cross. And you know, the thing I think that really, that really cost him this agony, it says, if you read on, it says that he was like sweating great drops of blood. He was under such tremendous pressure. Was it the, the beating that he was going to get? Was that bothering him? No. The crown of thorns, was he thinking about all oh, that crown of thorns? Man, it's going to hurt. That's not what he was thinking about. Was he thinking about the people mocking him and making fun of him while he was hanging on that cross? Was he thinking about how all his disciples were going to betray him? No, I don't think any of that stuff made him sweat great drops of blood. I'll tell you what did. He knew that in just a few short hours, when he was hanging on that cross, the sky was going to turn black. It was going to get dark. And for the first time in all of eternity, Jesus was going to look up and say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because he's going to be bearing the sin of the world from Adam until now. Shedding his blood to pay the price for the remission of our sins. Being, being cut off from the Father through this sin. He never became a sinner, but he became a our sin. The bloody, ugly Christ hanging on a cross. The altar of sacrifice that only He could make, that only He could give. Reading on a little bit more, it says, in verse 40, He comes to His disciples and finds them asleep and said unto them, Peter, what could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went again the second time and prayed, O oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then comes he to his disciples and say unto them, Sleep on now. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And they took Jesus. They came, Judas came and took Jesus. And the band of men. It says in the Gospel of John, when they came up and they said, Where's Jesus? And he said, I am he. They all fell down. All got slain in the Spirit. Because <laughs> the power of God. Jesus said, his disciples pulled out swords. They were getting ready to fight. He said, put the swords away. He said, if I wanted to, I could call legions of angels and wipe this bunch out. He said, but I've got to do what my God, what my Father told me to do. And he was taken and he was beaten and he was mocked and he crowned of thorns and he was nailed to the cross and shed his blood that your sin and my sin could be forgiven. See that altar that Noah built was thanking God for his mercy. When we come to the altar of the cross, we need to thank God for his mercy. Because if it wasn't for him being willing to offer his blood on that altar, you and I and every other human being that ever lived would be on our way to a Christless, eternal hell. In a lake of fire. 
But I thank God that he was willing to say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done at that altar. That's the altar we need to rebuild. That's the altar we need to go to. There's too much other stuff. There's all kinds of other stuff going on. All kinds of other things that people want to try to push in and push on you and push you into and everything else. Listen, I need nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's what I need. If I stay at that altar, he'll take care of the rest. He'll light my path. He'll direct my steps. He'll tell me where to go and where not to go. He'll tell me how to live and what not to do. All I need to do is grab a hold of that altar and let the blood of Jesus wash me. I need to be washed. I mean, I need to put on a, on a bloody garment, brother. Just like they did in the, in the garden. Be covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we need this morning. That's what we, that's what we celebrate at the Lord's table this morning. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. I don't need a Ph.D. I don't need a doctorate. I don't need some psychiatrist telling me what i got to do. What I need is to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. How many people want to be washed in the blood? How many want to go back to the altar? Rebuild the altar where you began. Where you started your walk with Christ. Where you started your new life in Christ. The altar where blood was shed. Where his life was given for you. Before we have communion this morning, I want to give you the opportunity to examine yourself. Examine yourself. Please don't examine me. I have to examine myself. Don't examine that person sitting next to you or the one in front of you or behind you. But take a good look at yourself in the mirror of God's word. And thank God for his sacrifice. Listen, when Jesus was hanging on that cross, the word says, it pleased the Lord. That was a sweet-smelling savor that went up into the nostrils of God. That he gave his life so that all our sins could be forgiven. I want to ask you this morning, are your sins forgiven through faith in the blood? Of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask Georgia to come and just, just play softly.